Hey guys and gals, my name's Nick. And my name's Bert. Bert, Brett, what's the difference? It's all the same. If you pull uh, all the vowels out, it is. Is it? Interesting. I knew that. That makes sense. It's like, you know, two plus two equals fish. Everybody knows that. Yeah. You know? Just do a two plus two, it equals Bert. Problem solved, my man. So, any hoozles, any Jorge, what's today's topic? My main man, Bert, my main man, Brett, my main man. I'll, oh, I'll today name. we're talking about computers. Computers. What kind of computers, Bert? I feel like there should be a distinction on what we're, like what kind we're doing here. Because when you we're told not me about, talking it, about it, the like... fun kind of computers that has like Call of Duty and spreadsheets and stuff on it, we're talking about the crusty grandpas of computers, the mechanical and analog computers. I'm uh, and all the fun stuff that goes into that. I you. you... You got me. You got me with analog. I don't even know what does that mean, buddy. Uh, I'm kind of struggling trying to. We talking like a keyboard mouse kind of setting, or is this something that like I'm even uh, like I I can't even describe myself. So what is analog? Uh, so you know what music is, right? Music like uh. That cool stuff that comes out of those, uh, the nice jukebox or the, the nice, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, the nice record do you player, the gramophone. Record music. Yeah. Back in the day, you had a wax disc. And if you wanted to put music on it, you had to, uh, take sound waves that are wiggling through the air and, uh, yell at a needle loud enough to make the, needle wiggle the same way and put the wiggle on the the wax disc so that when you drag the needle back through the, the groove it would make the same sound as it did when it made it and uh, the wiggle is kind of continuous the, the groove in the wax is wiggling all, all the time it's going back and forth, it's capturing Everything, it's continuous. Uh, now, if you take it and put it on a CD, well, you're not recording all of the wave. You're only taking discrete bits of the sound wave. It is. It is actually taking bits. It's, it's uh, recording it digitally on magnets in the CD or on the hard drive and it's storing it as a series of ones and zeros which are uh, uh, what's the opposite of continuous? They're discrete. Non-continuous? Right. Yeah, discrete work. It's like uh, when you take a, a curvy line versus a, a series of rectangles trying to approximate it. Okay. Is that, that there are there are people who go nutty about like audio quality and stuff and they'll say like oh well you see a, an old fashioned record is much better sound because it's analog because it's not uh, reducing it into ones and zeros and stuff it's capturing the whole thing which, if it were, which, while technically true, the difference shouldn't be discernible to human ears, and especially if you're playing it on, like, a bad speaker. Uh, but sorry, what were you saying? In, in college, they had a uh, math course called Discrete Math. So I'm trying to, I guess my mind is trying to wrap itself around, like, what... I, you you said the discrete 
was the opposite of tenuous. So it's like, can you explain to me what discrete means? Because I never understood what discrete math was, and I'm sure there's no correlation, but I, I, I have a hard time with that word. I don't know what it means is what I'm getting. Uh, it's the opposite of continuous, I'm pretty sure. Discrete definition math. We cheat and use Wikipedia a lot on this. Uh, but I'll admit it to this time. Details. We can't know everything. That's why we have references, buddy. We do that cool thing called checking the facts. Objects in discrete math include integers, graphs, and statements in logic. Uh, it excludes topics in continuous mathematics, such as real numbers, calculus, and Euclidean geometry. Oh. Discrete objects are uh, integers. Oh. Deals with countable uncle. sets. It has like a finite number versus calculus, which is sometimes infinite in theory. Okay. Um, my brain. Is yeah, cal calculus that. deals a lot with the infinitesimal hmm. uh, concepts and notations from discrete math are useful in setting and describing objects. Problems and branches of computer science, uh, uh, such as algorithms, programming, cryptography, blah 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 blah. blah. Okay. Uh, anywho. Appreciate it. So basically, computer talks. The computer that you're watching this on now talks and beeps and boops. It, it talks in ones and zeros. Uh, and for those it, that didn't it, know, it can't, it can't is do, a computer. It can't do half or a third. It's either zero or it's one. If somehow you had an analog computer, it could do zero and one and an infinitesimally small numbers in between. Okay. I get that to a certain degree. Uh, which makes Wouldn't it a lot be... trickier, <laughs> but maybe a bit more fun. I like how I know uh, trickier just means, man, this is just really complicated. So, so much. To, today we're mostly talking about mechanical computers. You can make an analog computer electrical. And you can make a binary computer out of crabs. Or about crabs. You, you can model a, a logic gate as about anything, you know, if, if, if you have a, if, if you have a good maze and a series of doors and a series of crab baits, you could make a logic gate out of crabs. Like we're talking hermit crabs, right? Yeah, yeah. Like the crustacean. Okay, because okay, I'm like, there's the clap, which is sexual, and I'm like, that's interesting. Not sure how that would work. That would be a much more interesting computer. <laughs> Let's just go get some nice uh, some nice uh, night workers and we'll throw them into a series of games. Yeah, there you I'm go. Sure I'm sure this will work really well. It's all for science, of course. We're men of science, of engineering standards. Yeah. Uh, I think I might like crustaceans better. I don't even know how you would do that with a crab. So anyways, the ancient Greeks. The They're Greek famous Indians? for doing a lot of cool things. 
uh, sitting around and talking about fancy stuff. Uh, but they're not the world's most famous engineers. And if they made a lot of cool stuff, we usually don't find too much of it. The problem of with making stuff out of bronze and iron and shit back in the olden days was that somebody else could just come along and like melt it down into whatever they wanted it to be. Like they made a big statue, uh, the Colossus of Rhodes, right? And it was like huge. It was like big enough you could sail a boat between its legs. Yeah, but one like, of the uh, ancient wonders of the world. Yeah, but like they scrapped it for parts more or less they they just melted it down did they yeah i mean Damn. i think it fell apart in an earthquake and maybe later people kept dragging it up and dragging up bits of it and melting it down into cannons and stuff but uh that's why it's a big deal to find uh not not just uh artifacts made out of bronze and stuff I, it's a big deal to find something that's mechanically intricate and complicated. You know, they're not famous clockmakers and stuff, but they found something really cool in a shipwreck. They found the Antikythera mechanism. Say that five times uh, fast. What's that? Say that five times fast. Antikythera, 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 Antikythera. Okay, point taken. How the hell do you spell that? That's not important right now. Uh, okay, so <laughs> there's a lot of vowels in it. Yes, it's all Greek to me. You go say it. Greeks did a thing. Now it's all Greek. Hmm. I, I see how that would, <laughs> how those two don't relate. So what about this thing in a shipwreck? Well, it's like an astronomical clock for computing the motions of the heavens, looking at the movement of the sun and planets, trying to plan out your calendar and stuff, which has been an awfully big deal, you know, before the 21st century when you just connected to the Wi-Fi and it did it automatically. <laughs> So this thing, like, did it? Does it actually work? Like, does, do people still have it, or is it like just theorized? Well, the problem with being on the ocean floor for two thousand years is that it kind of gets like rusted together. Oh, and kind of like deformed. So seen a you you can tell looking at it that it's pretty much a clock. Uh but. People have sunk entire careers into trying to figure out what exactly it looked like and exactly how it worked. Uh, but it it's, okay. it made tons of headlines as like, hey, we knew the ancient Greeks were pretty cool, but they made a whole freaking analog computer and we didn't even know about it until we dug it up. Sheesh. Like, it wasn't in anyone's notes or journals. Like, I feel like that would be a kind of a big fancy toy thing that, like, one of the emperors would, you know... I'm thinking no, wrong. No, I, I saw nice... something on TV about how they had written accounts of a few mechanical doodads about, like, oh, if you put a coin in, a hand will pop out and give you a ball of soap. And people seem to think that was a pretty big deal, but, like... uh a few mechanical toys that? pop out throughout wow. history without too much. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, they do with like. How does that shit work? Is that infrared or something? Is it just a photoreceptor? Ah, uh, you're asking the wrong guy there, bud. I deal with dirt. I don't deal with the mechanical <laughs> stuff. I leave that one to you. And if you don't know, we're both fucked. So. Uh, if I had to guess, best guess, I'd say something like uh, they'd probably use a loaded spring and maybe a few sensors here or there, 
has to be something real simple, no? I suppose it has to be simple enough. And anyway. Anyway, back to the Greek astronomy clock thing that we know lots about. Uh, so so people argue about exactly how it was shaped and exactly how it worked and stuff. But it it's pretty neat, you know, like the Dwemer from Skyrim. Like it's kind of that vibe of like weird brass steampunky stuff. That's that. Uh, have you um you read Percy Jackson, right? Yeah, they've got some of that. Yeah, a lot I, of that stuff we... is based off of like. The vibes of the Antikythera mechanism. Because uh, I think it was towards the second series, right? Like, you got uh, this kid named Leo, and he's the son of Hephaestus. And so, like, I I always pictured it kind of, because I'm looking at a picture of this thing. I always pictured it, whatever he was making in the books, to look like him. Not to look like him. Anything that he would make out of bronze and shit, or in all of their, you know, like, Greek supplies, it always felt like it looked like that. If that makes sense. I'm not sure if you've actually read the book, but it's it's pretty good. I liked it. From what I remember. It's been so long, Bert. Yeah. Uh, but there were a lot of moving parts in this thing. And it was able to do some cool stuff. Uh, predicting, like, eclipses and stuff. That was a big <laughs> deal. Uh... If one caught you at a surprise, you might think that the moon was end, that the world was ending. You know. Also, I think I talked to you in the car a while ago about how, like, from your perspective on Earth, the planets move really weird. Like most of the time, they seem to go forwards, but sometimes they go backwards for a bit, and then keep going the other way. Uh, but refresh my mind on how the hell the planet goes backwards. Or is it just because, like, I'm moving forward in a different direction in my elliptical sphere? Versus the reality else? is, is that everyone's moving around the sun at different speeds. So when you get close to them and overtake them, it looks like they're going backwards for a bit. Cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they go. Yep. And then uh, they, they like to model it as everyone's going around the Earth, but they're doing these epicycles where everyone's also doing their their own little funky circles. And they tried to explain it away like that. Uh, but this machine is able to model some of that. I mean, I'm sure it's not. I mean, for its time, I'm sure it was accurate. But in today's standards, is it accurate? If I mean, I, I don't know. We can't fucking tell because it's you know, rusted as shit. I'm just curious, like, would it, you know, be as accurate as... Like, what's its accuracy rate? Like, 30%? 40%? Well, this thing doesn't fucking work. It... It's been rusting for 30... for 2,000 years. Well, I'm just curious uh, if, like, the uh, you know the models, you know, if they depict, you know, it's accurate. As a general rule, uh, when you're working with an imperfect, uh, uh, when when you're working with an imperfect model for your astronomy, the more time goes out, the more you're going to get errors. Things might start off for a few years looking pretty good, but then they'll get a little iffier, a little iffier, until you get centuries down the line, and it just doesn't work at fucking all. Oh. That was a big deal in ancient Egypt and stuff, and when you had like uh, astronomical data going back centuries, built on a centuries-old model, but it, it's drifted enough for you to take notice. So how do you keep that shit accurate? Uh, you just change it once in a while. Oh, okay. I guess that Which in a case like this would mean making a whole different fucking machine. I'm not sure exactly how reprogrammable this thing is. 
Um, maybe you got a shade exactly of blue what, too. Exactly what your uh, qualifications are be to meet the definition of computer. I don't know. But you know what does meet the definition of a Turing complete computer able to do uh, a surprisingly large number of functions that we associate with a modern day computer? What's that, Bert? The analytical engine. That was a nice segue. I like that. That was real good, Bob. Okay. Shut what about up, baby? I know it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, this entire topic is just kind of like uh, I'm learning as we go so back in the old days they didn't have calculators which was a big pain in the ass right because you were trying to do tons of math but you had to do it by hand and it took forever right yep uh, remember so, those people, so people said gee it sure would be handy to have some kind of shortcut to do all this big, heavy math. So they invented the logarithm. All of a sudden, you can turn all your multiplication and division into addition and subtraction. Oh, how I love that. Handy dandy. It was. I mean, up until like the 80s, like it was pretty standard for in the industry for engineers to carry up a little holster on their belt with a slide rule in it. Jesus. Yeah, it's true. Glad I didn't uh, live to uh, that. But the problem is, in the 1800s, you didn't have a slider rule. You just had like a table with all the logarithms written down, and they were calculated by hand. And the type for the they were making these things in a printing press, and they had to be set by hand. And there was enough human error in these things to cause pretty serious concern. <laughs> to go, oh, well, I didn't mean to have that steam engine explode. I did everything right. I, I took all the logarithms from the back of the table. It just turns out the back of the table was wrong. Uh, because I'm cool right today. What's that? Oh, yeah, because whatever we engineer it's like oh yeah the, my references just happen to be wrong yeah yeah i love that so okay. so not o not only would it be nice to have a machine to do your addition and subtraction it would be nice to have something that made sure that your logarithms got printed out and calculated correctly and okay. uh this guy charles babbage figured out a really cool way to do this like he basically designed a computer in the 1820s that would run off of steam and uh be uh turning piles of gears instead of uh uh crunching bits i mean i'm sure it used a lot of coal didn't it i mean it's it steam so uh, I mean, what's the one one math equation gets you well the thing is is that 1820 like steel and stuff is getting cheaper but like it was still an ungodly expensive project you know it it would have cost like the cost of maintaining the british navy to build difference engine and that's just one that like adds and subtracts and shit like halfway through the project the guy turned around and said wait a minute instead of just doing a thing that adds and subtracts I can make a whole fucking computer I can make a whole analytical engine I can get it to run loops and stuff I can get it to uh, to print and have a bell that goes ding when it's done uh yeah. I can get it I like to the bell do, part. I can give it internal memory and conditional branching and shit. Like if then statements <laughs> type of thing. I can do all this cool shit. And like uh he stole uh he stole punch cards 
from like uh, the looms, the weaving looms that they were using in France. So yeah, you you, you just uh, feed it instructions on punch cards, and it'll crunch it through the piles of gears, and it'll uh, spit it out an answer for you. Really? Yeah, it, it's sort of it's sort of general purpose in that way. That's what makes it a big deal is that it doesn't just do one particular thing, but you can program it to do about whatever mathematical test task you wanted. Okay, so why was it just stupid expensive to make, or why wasn't this oh, available, yeah. I guess? Because this is kind of the first time I'm hearing of it, besides just briefly talking about it. We wanted to know about steampunk stuff in an earlier episode, and uh, uh, the book about the Difference Engine was about the first steampunk book. Was it the world's greatest book? No. Uh, it was interesting. It's interesting to know about this kind of stuff. <laughs> Brett's uh, they, I think, I think they, I think they, I think they built like half of the Difference Engine before they ran out of money. And like for a while, a few of the early, early computer guys in like the forties, like went on pilgrimage to go see it and went, "Well, that's fucking disappointing." Um, I'm sure it's. Uh, but yeah, fun. it it's basically a modern computer conceptually. Like this dude in the 1800s figured out conceptually how it could work. And I mean, I'm I'm not a computer scientist person. I don't uh, know all the fun theory behind all this shit. I don't know what exactly makes it Turing complete and all that. But, but uh, mechanically, it's cool. <clears throat> so, did they ever finish this thing? Because you said they got about halfway before they ran out of funding. No, they got about halfway through the, the different. Prince one, the and subtract one, not, but they never tried to build the uh, uh, computer one, the analytical engine. The the one that goes, oh, yes, harder math. The one with, yeah, the one with loops and stuff. Has anybody tried to, I guess, kind of finish it? Because I'd be interested to see. Yeah, it. yeah. Mean, uh, they have. There's, there's been a few people who tried to finish it. Uh, let's see. And... I think London Science Museum has a working different engine that they built in the nineties. Uh, damn. There's a few people trying to like raise support to uh modernize and digitize all of the original plans to uh, put together a fancy CAD model of it. Oh, I'm sure that won't be a pain in the ass. No, not at all. Oh, yeah. Let's let's make a CAD drawing of this old thing, and half of it's not even done, so... It, uh, I love AutoCAD so much. It, it never gets frustrating, buddy. Never. Oh yeah. Can you tell my it's, sarcasm it's over? Stuff. Can you can you tell my sar uh, tell by my sarcasm that it's sarcasm over the mic? Because sarcasm and AutoCAD. Ugh. Well, I'm 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 happy that somebody is doing a thing and trying to make it happen. It'd be right. cool to see. I don't but I don't know if I'd want to do that. This guy is still sort of a base. 10 system you know it, it's mostly just a ton of gears stacked on each other with each tooth in the gear being labeled like 1 through 10 weren't uh, we talking about like a base 12 system or something and then how like the days in the month got like yeah hard. if if you uh, put 16 teeth on the gears there's just no reason that you couldn't make it do hex dust I don't think I can count hex decks Whatever the hell that is. If you had 16. two teeth on the gear, maybe you could... Yeah, I, I don't know why they use a base 16 system sometimes, but they 
Sure do. Uh, 1632. Anyhow, if, if, you did, if you did two teeth on the gear, it, it would just be back to binary. Now, we don't like binary, because that's been done. No, no the, sir. The, the perfect analog computer would have infinitely many teeth on these gears. It, it would just be a sphere. Which brings How us the to the... How does that work? I'm glad oh, that you asked, because they actually made things like that to solve differential equations and fancy calculus. Oh, we they made we did. differential analyzers, uh, where it works sort of like back when mice had wheels. You know, it's it it would just be like a, a big ball with uh, uh, wheels that that rub up against it, and, and it would spin around. And by tracing out certain areas and measuring the how far the wheels go, you could do some pretty fancy calculus like that. <clears throat> We're pissed uh, that I didn't have this when that, I was that's, taking FEQ. That's not the only way to mechanically do calculus. You know, when when you think about integration and differentiation conceptually, uh, there's no reason that you couldn't do it physically. You know, no, like if you if you wanted to find the area under a curve, you know, you, you can try and do an integral and stuff. You can try and, like, do Riemann sums or try and approximate it with a bunch of triangles and squares. Or you can take a hunk of steel and carve your curve onto it and then fucking weigh it. I love it. We're gonna fucking weigh it. And then you can that, just have a, a have a arm that moves across the curve. You say, "Oh, okay. Well, I, I want to go this far up. Well, great. That puts me on this point on the curve. That's a pretty valid way to do uh, analog computing with calculus." And they did that yeah. for like a lot of artillery purposes. Like I'm pretty sure battleships and stuff in World War II had something like that for artillery. Really? Damn. I mean, there there are plenty of ways to do analog and mechanical computing, but there's some fun stuff that they got away with. Uh, I just love the idea of somebody frantically writing down Diffie Q equations in the middle of a boat. <laughs> it's just, it's just like, Mine captains, they are, they are, they are, uh, they are gaining on us, and we have not hit them with the torpedo yet. Scheiße, five minutes, five minutes, I am almost done. <laughs> Carry the two. Oh, I forgot to add the plus C on the end. No, not the plus C. <laughs> Oh, I always hated it when professors docked you for not uh, having the plus C. Um, such a such a shitty way to get like minus a fucking eight points. Right, or like like they problem. they slam the steel door to your compartment of the U boat as it begins to fill with water, and you go, oh. I forgot to add the plus C. That's why we got hit by the artillery. Oh, that's why we're going down. Oh, fuck. Then you drown. I don't knew that. Why didn't anybody tell me? I don't know. That's... Uh, I'm, I'm not a computer science guy. I'm not an expert on this stuff. But I think it's interesting that you can do it. A lot of this stuff mechanically. I think it's fun. I mean, the, the difference engine is is cool and good. And fun and all. I mean, in in the book, it lets you have credit cards, a hundred and twenty years early. Uh but I I mean, even after that, you know, people still had like mechanical 
computers for adding and subtracting and stuff, you know. Like, uh, they had mechanical cash registers, you know, where, where you, you just punch the uh, numbers on the keypad and it adds it up for you and you, you pull the big lever and it goes cha-ching. The door slides out and it prints it onto the thing. Is that a computer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of. It it sure does add and subtract. It's when you make it digital and can print it on a little tiny thing and run it on a little tiny solar panel that it uh, puts the those guys and the slide rules and stuff out of business. Jesus, I mean, if that if we're if we're taking that as a definition of a computer, I mean, could a could a TV remote like be an analog computer? It just seems. <laughs> I mean, it sounds stupid, but you're inputting uh, small things and it's shooting a laser. I mean, I'm pretty sure it has to be reprogrammable. I mean, huh. I, I know you program a TV remote, but I think that's more or less just like setting the frequency. I guess you can remap some of the buttons on it. Maybe it is. I, I mean, it seems like a very almost loose kind of definition, but like, meh. What can you do? Yeah, I mean, uh, in their own way, like just the abacus and the the slide ruler sort of computer. You know, can you reprogram it? Can it help you add numbers and shit? Yeah, kinda. Yeah, I'd say so. Oh, I mean, they they had fancy mechanical robots every once in a while in like the Middle East or Europe in the 1600s or whatever. One of the famous ones was supposed to be really good at playing chess. You know, it was like a mechanical man, and it would move pieces on a chessboard and, like, play a live opponent. That's pretty good. Uh, Being able to respond to various uh, uh, chess plays and stuff is kind of uh, reprogrammable. It can kind of redo its stuff. Bruh, this is Skynet. No, 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 no. The, the thing about the, the mechanical Turk who plays chess is that there's just a dude inside the machine. There's just a chess grandmaster who hides inside. Oh. That's okay, how they got so away you with that. Tell me, Sky, that's nothing more than a Turkish overlord trying to take over the world. That's right. One chess what you, at a what time. you thought was a DARPANET supercomputer was really just the intern inside, like running around pushing the buttons, sort of like how an ATM machine works. Where there's a little guy inside who, who takes your money and then slides back out again. I knew it. It was just a Turk coming to steal my money in my chest. I mean, uh, so, you, so you you heard it here. Uh, computers are fake and gay, and uh, there's a little man who lives inside your TV remote. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right, I think that's a good stopping point, my guy. I I really don't have anything else. I learned a bit. Um. You got anything else that you want to say before <laughs> you say that all computers are gay and ran by a Turkish man? <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, let's see. Internet privacy is a myth. They know what you're doing all the time. Uh, they're omnipotent gods, and they don't care. Uh, yep. They'll they'll take your freedom and your private information and sell to advertisers and wipe their ass with the money. Okay, thanks for coming. Bye bye. Well, guys, that's uh, that's hurt. <laughs> I'm Nick. Have a wonderful rest of your day and fuck our overlords, I guess. <laughs>